Um, so, welcome to this session, which is called Capacity Building for Road Safety. Um, my name is Wiebke Pankauke. I am Deputy Head of Unit for Road Safety in the European Commission's Department for Transport, DG Move. And I'm really very pleased um, that I was asked to moderate this session because I believe that is really right at the center of what we're trying to achieve in our work on road safety at EU level. So I started when preparing for this session, I started uh, with uh, just looking up the definition of capacity building. You all probably know, of course, very well. I just do um, to remind myself. So Wikipedia comes up with this. Capacity building is the process by which individuals and organizations obtain, improve and retain the skills, knowledge, tools, equipment and other resources needed to do their jobs competently. So I'm very much looking forward to those skills, knowledge, tools and equipment for road safety that our panelists will share with us today. And I look forward to discussing with them and with all of you how we obtain, improve and retain them. So let's see. Uh, but first of all, just a few words about why I think it's so central what the European Commission is doing on is why capacity building is so central to what we are doing. Um, maybe some of you know or most of you know that last year we adopted a road safety policy framework for road safety. We have ambitious targets, uh, a 50 percent reduction of fatalities and serious injuries by 2030 on our way to vision zero by 2050. Um, and of course, the policy framework is a lot about legislation and about monitoring the things that the Commission does. But it also talks a lot about cooperation and exchange. And we like to hear from member states, from regions, from towns and cities, what works and what doesn't. And we try and help others to transfer the lessons to their work. Um, and this can take various shapes of expert meetings, of funding of projects, of an award, like our EU Urban Road Safety Award, for example or of a twinning arrangement, for example, as well. And there I would just like to do a little bit of advertising and uh, a little bit of um, uh, give you an example of, uh, of what we're doing at the moment. We're doing uh, what we call the EU Road Safety Exchange, which is a, a twinning project that started last year and that we are running with the help of the European Transport Safety Council. And there we have six countries that need to catch up on road safety and that are twinned with six countries that can help them on their journey. The program runs over three years and is already producing results and we are very pleased with it. And I'm actually wondering if this might be something that uh, could also be explored at city level, at cities and towns and sort of twinning on road safety. And I'd love to hear your views on that. But before, of course, let's hear from our wonderful panelists there. You can see them all um, joining us. Um, before I present them to you, um, maybe a few things on housekeeping. There should be uh, coming up on the screen now. Exactly there it is. Um, a few hints what you can do um, in this session. I think it's probably not the first session you're all following, so you're probably already very familiar with it. Um, there are different things and buttons you, around the screen where you can um, do go to different places, do some uh, adjust your settings, and chat for example. And just for the chat, I would like to ask you to make very good use of the chat. If you go on chat and then session, you can uh, chat with everyone. And that is where you can ask all your questions. And we look forward to your questions. Um, please already go ahead um, asking your questions as um, the panelists present, because we'll take a few questions after each presentation. And then, of course, we'll have more time to discuss with everyone at the end. Um, and now I would like uh, all the panelists to uh, to be visible. I think they are, and I'd like to introduce them to you. So we have Susan Anderson is a senior advisor in traffic safety at the city of Gothenburg in the Urban Transport Administration. She's responsible for the strategic traffic safety planning in the city. And she also works in the program office of a Swedish strategic innovation program, which is called Drive Sweden, and that drives the development towards sustainable mobility solutions for people and goods. Suzanne is going to present a key tool for urban road safety, namely a municipal road safety audit as the basis for a new direction for road safety work. Welcome, Suzanne. Then we have Rico Andrisa and Jan Auke Fespui. I hope I didn't make too much of a mess of the last name. Um, Rico is senior advisor and expert in traffic safety at Goudappel Koffing, a mobility consultancy from the Netherlands. 
Um, and as road safety auditor, he is working on providing safe roads for all road users. Um, he and Jan Auke will introduce us to his work or to their work on an integrated approach to road safety on Antwerp's Ring Road. And Jan Auke, uh, who will join, uh, join Rico in the presentation, is project leader, road design and traffic safety auditor at Witteveen and Boss, an international consultancy firm from the Netherlands as well. Then we have Wilma Slinger. I think we can't see Wilma at the moment, but I hope we can see her later. And she works at a not-for-profit organization and knowledge platform called Crow in the Netherlands. Her main topics are management of projects in the fields of road safety, influencing behavior and road safety education. She is going to ask an excellent question. What would you do with 1 billion euro road safety money? What a question. She will tell us what this question has to do with the Dutch risk assessment approach. And then we have Thiago Alejo who is a, an architect and works in the Municipal Chamber of Lisbon as a designer of public space in terms of accessibility and pedestrian safety. And Tiago will talk about keeping pedestrians safe on Lisbon Street. And we also have Roman Rohrberg with us, who uh, is also working with Tiago on this project in Lisbon. And he works at Mio Vision and helps cities and traffic engineers to collect accurate uh, traffic data. He works with cities to ensure traffic studies are conducted with all road users in mind, particularly vulnerable road users. So welcome everyone. Uh, and now without further ado, I'd like to turn to Suzanne for the first presentation. Suzanne, the floor is yours. Thank you. So this might be the history of a city that succeeded very, very well and sort of got a little comfortable in that. Uh, so let's start off with, sorry. Uh, uh, we started in the, in the early 90s when uh, the rates of uh, injuries in fatalities in Gothenburg was alarmingly high. It was twice as many as in Stockholm, which is uh, uh, twice the uh, size of Gothenburg. So the city started an extensive program to take uh, control of the situation. And a few years later, the Swedish government approved of the Vision Zero, uh, as you all know about now. Uh, and that was a clear and ambitious uh, vision that no one should be killed or uh, have a uh, severe injury in traffic. And as you can see on the graph uh, in from the early 90s, Gothenburg has succeeded very well until what you see here in the 2010, uh, but we still fail every day. So if we have a look at uh, those years around um, uh, 2000, uh, we really boosted the Vision Zero initiative and our, pro uh, and our measures were really speed, ma speed management and still are. So we rolled out a big number of uh, <clears throat> both progressive and innovative um, speed reducing measures. Uh, elevated crossing lanes, uh, safer passages by tram stations, speed reducing measures at in school areas, a large number of roundabouts and our speed bumps. There are more than 3000 of these measures in the city now. And how did we succeed? If you see at this uh, graph, uh, when we increased the number of uh, speed, managers, speed management measures, the injuries decreased. So there is some kind of connection there. So wh what are the success factors then? Well, we have had access to hospital data since the late 80s. And that really gives us a lot of knowledge about the injuries and who's injured and where and how. Uh, we have a, a, a lot of other knowledge and data about the traffic system, uh, such as flow and speed. Uh, we have communicated and accepted targets that triggers resources. And that's a good thing. Uh, and we had the Vision Zero as a guiding star. Uh, 
Uh, and we know by, we did a, 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 um, an evaluation and we know that 75% of the improvement you can see in this picture is due to the speed management uh, measures and they are cost efficient. Every invested euro is estimated to have given a socioeconomic benefit of approximately 25 euros in return. So in the road safety program for 2010 to 2020, the last year this year, we sort of set out the targets uh, uh, from the graph you saw in the, in the previous picture by halving the uh, uh, injuries every fifth year. But that's not the reality today. If you look at the right graph, you can see the, the target for the injuries and we are far from the goals. And there are still um, people losing their lives in Gothenburg every year. Uh, to this year, we already have 10 fatalities, most of them on the, um, on the national roads, but we count them as well. And if we look, look a little deeper into the figures for 2019, you can see the red line. And that's where the target is, because the darker turquoise on the top are pedestrian falls, and they are not included in the target. And uh, the darker orange is by uh, cyclists in single accidents, and they are the biggest group together with the pedestrian fall accidents. And if you look at the brighter turquoise and orange, that are the pedestrians and cyclists in conflict with, um, with the vehicles. And as you can see, we are not, we have not reached zero, but we're still uh, quite few. And that's the result of the speed management measures. So something had to be done. We have been too comfortable, I think, in that speed management is the only thing to work with. But as you can see, it's not. And business as usual is not good enough. So we looked around and we find a method uh, at the Swedish Association of Local Authorities and Regions for road safety audit for municipalities. So we adopted that uh, method and uh, in this method, the uh, management system ISO 39001 is integrated. Uh, so what the road safety audits results in is uh, a description of the current situation, um, strength, strengths and weaknesses, and suggestions for improvements and priorities. And uh, we think that this could be a good basis for the direction of the continued traffic safety work together with uh, trends in the world around us. There are seven assessment areas, uh, as you can see, and uh, I won't talk about every one of them. And they are eight points, and you can see the eighth is additions that we did uh, because we have tramways in Gothenburg, and the method doesn't include tramways. And the method uh, is a couple of years old, so new mobility solutions isn't included as either. Uh, so we did this work uh, uh, by uh, with help of a um, consultant bureau, and what were the results then? Well, you're not supposed to read all this text, but if you look at this picture, it seems to be a lot of green areas. So. There is a lot of good things that we have uh, when it comes to road safety in these uh, assessment areas. But does this all this green mean that we have a really good road safety work? Well, if we take a look at some examples of the green um, requirements that you saw in the last picture, uh, we can see that the we have based our work on the Vision Zero. Uh, we have a lot of speed bumps and we have um, uh, separated uh, the bicycle network from traffic. Uh, 
in the extent of approximately 75%. We have requirements for purchasing new vehicles, which include safety requirements. And uh, we have road safety design requirements, both for new and redesigned streets. So there are a lot of requirements, guidelines and handbooks. That's a good basis. But if we look at weaknesses, we don't follow up. If we use all these guidelines and requirements in our, uh, are meant to improve the road safety in the projects, we have no follow up on road safety in the city with indicators other than the goals. And if you look at the goals, there are a lot of other things, not only that what uh, the city does. For example, the um, vehicle industry has improved the, the cars immensely during these 10 years. And we have a speed plan that is awaiting a national decision on base speed in urban areas. And we are still waiting and waiting. And as I said before, the pedestrian fall in accidents are not included in the road safety program. So the audit's uh, conclusions and recommendations are that put road safety in the context of sustainable mobility. And Agenda 2030 gives us a good uh, context for that. Because the, in, in the sustainable uh, city and sustainable mobility, it has to be clean, silent, accessible and secure as well as safe. Uh, we need to improve management and a systematic approach. Uh, and I'll come back to that. Uh, in the last uh, road safety program, we, we have prioritized uh, pedestrians and cyclists, but mainly when it comes to uh, speed management. Uh, so we have to include uh, the pedestrians and cyclists when we are talking about maintenance as well. Uh, there has to be even and non-slippery surfaces, for example. We have to keep up the good work with speed management and work even more with travels, vehicles and transport. I don't think we have safety requirements when we purchase transports today. And we have to be a part in the development of the new mobility solutions, innovation and in the technology development. We are doing that uh, uh, quite well today. We are, uh, for example, working with geofencing and uh, we have ISA as a requirement when we purchase uh, cars in the city. So next step and the to-do list. Um, the management for the administration has started a management committee exclusively for road safety to really increase the management of road safety within the administration. We are going to propose Vision Zero as one of the city's visions, even though it's legislated in Sweden that Vision Zero, Vision Zero should be the guiding star for all road safety work. We should sort of think that it would be a good thing to have the Vision Zero also for the city of Gothenburg to work with other administrations within the city that also have a road safety uh, could have a road safety perspective on that, uh, on their own, um, um, what they are working with. Uh, we need a new road safety plan and we need to in, include pedestrians fall accidents in when we are setting goals and indicators, not only goals. Uh, and when we uh, formulate our new strategies and focus areas. And to ensure we need to ensure basic competence in road safety uh, and Vision Zero and its application. Uh, the administration has grown with approximately, I think, 400% the last 10 years. We are now 430 um, uh, working at the administration. And when I started 15 years ago, we were 100. So uh, we have a lot to do to, to uh, build capacity and road safety uh, uh, in the administration. And once again, we got a little comfortable that 
road safety is in our walls, so to say, uh, or, in our, or in our DNA, but it isn't anymore. Uh, we have to have input from international goals and trends and uh, keep on being an uh, active part in development and innovation when it comes to new mobility solutions, uh, when it comes to as such as micromobility, geofencing, automated transport. So that's what we are working with now and we are really looking forward to our no new road safety plan that maybe will be finished uh, this year, I hope. Uh, no, next year, of course, in 2021, on our road to the Vision Zero. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suzanne. That was really super interesting. Thanks a lot. Um, and I see Pedro uh, is asking a question in the chat. I also have a question myself, but maybe we start with Pedro's question. So, um, Suzanne, are you already including single bike falls and crashes? Uh, so that is with no intervention from other vehicles. Oh, yes. Yes, this we we include them and has done so for yeah, okay. 20 years, I think, because we have access to hospital data and that has given us the opportunity to do so. Um, yes, great. And um, my question was actually on the geofencing. You mentioned that there and I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit on that, because I think you're one of the forerunners in that in that field. Um, if you could just explain a little bit how it how it works in Gothenburg. Yeah, we are taking part of the development and we are a test and demonstration area. Uh, so, for example, we have um, uh, a demonstration project or platform called the Electricity, uh, where we have tested electric buses. And uh, we have used the, the electric buses uh, for demonstration, different things, to demonstrate different things. Uh, for example, geofencing. And the, the bus has access to a map that uh, sort of tells the bus where it can drive uh, in different um, uh, speeds. And in certain places, we have limited the speed to 30. And the, uh, the driver can't, uh, he can't drive faster than 30. So the bus decides what is the maximum speed. And the drivers, they, they, are, they like that very much because they say, Okay, it's the bus mm -hmm. that decides, not me. So if others are complaining <laughs> on me, say it's the bus, not me. So, so it takes a, a lot of stress from okay. the from the drivers as well. Right, uh, and I, have, I see one more question in the chat, and then maybe we, we move on for now. Of course, you'll stay with us, and we'll have more time to discuss afterwards. But uh, Nick in the chat is wondering which indicators you are using. Well, that was one of our weaknesses that we have not uh, developed indicators. We have just used goals for 10 or 20 years now. Uh, so we need to, uh, to uh, develop uh, indicators. And I think the ISO 39001 is a very good tool to, uh, to develop okay. them. Thank you very much for now. Um, so let's travel now from Gothenburg Thank to you. Antwerp and uh, I'd like to ask Rico and Jan Auke to join us, um, join me on the virtual stage here. I see Rico um, and um, Jan Auke, are you there as well? And then let's hear, there, there you are. Yes. Um, so then let's hear about the integrated approach to road safety on Antwerp's Ring Road, please. Yes, thank you and good morning, everybody. Um, together with Jan Auke, I am going to tell you something about the, our road safety approach for the Antwerp Ring Road. Uh, we prepared this presentation together with uh, Matthijs Dieke, uh, my colleague who is a traffic psychologist, but we thought it was a little too much to have three presenters in such a small presentation. So we'll do this uh, together. We did the project of the Antwerp Ring Road uh, as a combination of Gautabokoffing and Witte van den Bos for the Lantis organization in, the, um, in Belgium. Uh, first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the project of uh, the closing 
project of the Antwerp Ring Road. Um, the Antwerp Ring Road in this moment is not a complete ring. Um, one link is missing, and that means that a lot of through traffic is going through uh, the city. And the idea of um, the Antwerp Ring Road is to close this, um, this link. Um, first, there was a plan to build a big bridge called the Lange Wapper. Um, and there was huge protests from the citizens of Antwerp um, saying that such a big uh, bridge didn't fit into the into the urban environment. That would be a, an interesting subject for a presentation as itself, but now we're going to look at uh, the follow-up of it and the road safety uh, processes of it. Um, now, from this protest, um, it was decided that there would be a tunnel plan, so no longer a bridge, but a, uh, a tunnel, um, including a lot of tunnels also in the existing uh, parts of the Antwerp Ring Road. Um, and the uh, design principles of this ring road are quite uh, interesting. Uh, one is that um, the new plan doesn't aim for all through traffic, for example, from the Netherlands to, to France. Um, the idea is that this through traffic uses um, the bypass road, which is more north, more outside of the built up areas. And that the new uh, Oosterweel verbinding, the uh, small ring road, is more for local regional traffic. Um, the other and interesting thing is that um, this uh, road is designed at a low speed. Um, the, lo the normal way to design a highway is to design a highway at high speeds. Um, but the city and the region of Antwerp has, have decided we don't want to build and we can't build area. Um, a ring, a, a highway with such high speed. So we design everything at a speed at 80 kilometers per hour, which allows us to use smaller um, design uh, elements. And the third uh, interesting um, design principle is that um, they have decided to have a models change. So a change from car traffic to public transport, to cycling, to walking as um, a target for the region, but also as a starting point for the design process. So um, the idea is that um, with other measures than um, this ring road project, um, the model split of the Antwerp re region will be at maximum 50% to, to uh, uh, private cars. Um, this um, is a target and is a part of a mobility plan, which is also being uh, made, but it, it also um, the starting point of the design of the ring road. So uh, there's not much, there's not much more capacity available uh, than that is um, needed for this uh, situation with the models change. Um, we as companies were asked to um, to have a vision on the road safety of this project um, and. Because there are a lot of tunnels in this um, in this project, this is an interesting uh, project to tell something about and to um, to study for road safety. Um, and you can compare the situation more or less um, like a garden hose. Uh, when you have a garden hose with a small uh, hole in it, then the pressure on these small holes will be extremely high. Well, this is more or less the case in this ring road because there are a lot of tunnels in the ring road. And the open parts of it um, have big pressure on them to uh, to design everything into them. One is that on these uh, locations where there's no tunnel, these are the, situ the places where the intersections uh, between the highway and the local uh, roads are to be built in. Um, second is that the traffic flows um, have to be organized into these small parts. Third is that. Um, into the tunnels, it's very difficult to inform road users in a good way about their choices that they can make. So also this information to the road users is for a big part to be uh, given into uh, the open parts in between the tunnels. And the third is um, being very small, those parts in between the tunnels, there's also the tunnel law, which says um, in the last 10 seconds before and after a tunnel, 
it is not allowed to um, to change the number of lanes. Um, so the open parts are even uh, made smaller because of this tunnel law. Um, and from this same tunnel law, there's also um, the possibility to give another approach to it. And it says that if you can't um, use this 10 second law, and that this is uh, in a lot of uh, opportunities, is it impossible in Antwerp? Um, then you make, have to make sure that the road safety is, is on a level which is um, as high as it could be with this tunnel law. So then the road safety check comes into uh, into a view. Um, we were asked to have a um, a check on the road safety of the project, um, and they decided not to um, to get the uh, road safety aspect in their own um, project organization, but to have to some fresh eyes from outside. Um, and when in Belgium they decide to have some Dutch experts into the project, the, 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 the need must be very high um, to do that. Um, what we try to do is to integrate the, uh, the approach from the road safety audit with an approach from human factors um, and to watch at the uh, designs which, was, which were there already uh, from those two, uh, those two points. We try to look further down those, than those 10 seconds and to see what a road user um, has to do within these small parts in and out of these tunnels. And we um, did our approach in cooperation with the road designers from Lantis organization and also with tunnel safety experts, especially from Witteveen and Bos, which could help us with, the, um, with those aspects. What we do, did was check the design, what that was already there, discuss possible uh, optimizations. Um, the road designers changed their uh, design and then we checked it again to have um, uh, a new uh, check of the road safety. And what we try to do is put all aspects, all aspects of the road safety in one fact sheet, which is shown on this uh, slide. So the road designers, but also the decision makers could from every aspect of the tunnel could see which uh, parts were quite safe and which parts needed extra um, extra uh, information or extra measures to get make it more safe. Uh, Jan Auke will take uh, the stage from here. Yeah, good morning everyone. Um, the fact sheets you see here, you saw on the last slide, we made uh, these fact sheets for each section of the Oosterville project and for each driving direction. Therefore, therefore we used uh, the road design drawings, but also uh, 3D animations. And you see, uh, what you see here on this slide is a screenshot from the animation for the Oosterville junction, driving towards Bruges. On this location, uh, multiple traffic flows need to merge. Two lanes from Brussels, one lane from Breda, one calamity lane from Breda and an on-ramp from the harbor. So in total five lanes, which need to merge to three lanes just after exiting a tunnel, and just before entering the next tunnel. So this is, a, this is a one, uh, one of the locations Rico mentioned before, an open part between two tunnels, but uh, well, on, the, on these locations, a lot of uh, maneuvers uh, happen. And merging is not the only attention point because right after the next tunnel, there is a road split for the, the, the next route choice. Um, and in the, the, the upcoming tunnel, there is not enough vertical space for road signings. So the signs for the split are also shown on this same location you see on this slide. So to summarize, uh, merging, route choice, approaching a tunnel, and also on a curvy road section. Well, we were asked to assess the whole Oosterweel project likewise, and come up with recommendations. Together uh, with the fact sheet, we made a slideshow with sketches of these recommendations. And well, on this slide, you see uh, one 
uh, example of uh, those sketches, this, uh, this measures, given uh, the specific circumstances and constraints, one, yeah, you could understand that there are not sufficient solutions available just in the road design. So therefore we also made recommendations in the field of road signing and more behavioral aspects of the driving task. So for example, this picture on the left, the left hand side shows a recommendation in which the road signing is a little bit adjusted so that the route choice is less difficult. Only one route choice at the same time and the road user focuses on the most ur urgent decision. On the right hand side of this slide, the tunnel wall, uh, you see uh, an example of tunnel wall, uh, wall decoration. Um, so uh, it helps the road user to be alert on the upcoming off ramp because there is lit little space in the tunnel for road signing because of the tunnel ceiling. Uh, but even with these soft measures, there can be situations in which the road situation is too difficult for road users. So to obtain a safe road situation, we came up with a package of measures. So the road design measures, speed measures, uh, assigning measures, soft measures, but also traffic flow limitations, restrictions. Because we concluded that only with a complete package of measures, the Antwerp Ring Road will be a safe road section on all moments of the day. Uh, based on our suggested package of measures, the road administration was uh, very sceptical when we started our assessment, approved uh, in the end the road design combined with uh, the package of measures, uh, which made uh, the project board uh, very happy. And uh, on this uh, slide you see the lessons uh, what we learned. So it's just a it's, um, combination of road design measures, but also uh, soft measures, steering measures, adjusted design, etc. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Hello there, I'm back again. Thank you very much. Um, my computer took uh, a little while to uh, load my video again. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting. And uh, I really like the, the way you said you have to look further than the 10 seconds. Huh? So uh, you really look uh, not only at, uh, at the, the road design, as you said, but also at, uh, at all the other aspects. And um, for now, I don't see any questions in the chat. Please, uh, audience, don't hesitate to ask. But I have one follow-up question myself. Um, you mentioned at the very beginning there were some protests, and then you also said it was difficult to convince uh, your counterparts um, at the beginning of the project. So I would just like to understand a bit more what, uh, how you went about addressing these things. Of course, they're all sensitive, especially when you talk about things like speed, for example. Uh, how, how do you go, go about convincing people? Um, well, actually, these, these decisions about changing um, the, the project from a, a big bridge project to this tunnel um, had been taken for the last uh, years before we came in. Uh, so the Lantus organization have been making these plans um, uh, for the last years and they made a, um, um, a deal with the World, with the citizens uh, movement to say, okay, uh, we are going to change our plan. We are not going to build this bridge, but we're going to do as much as possible to make the way, make the road away and fit it into the city. Um, that made the, the citizen organizations stop their protest and go say, okay, we, we if they do it like this, okay, we want to do this. Um, then the, the Lentis organization started designing uh, but there were some concerns at the national national level about the road safety and especially the road safety in combination with the tunnel safety. And so they needed a, let's say, a second look at their plans to uh, to make them more safe. And that is what we did and what we told about today. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, there's one more question that is actually also related to what you just said. So uh, you said that your clients wanted fresh eyes from the outside. Um, so if you could just develop a little bit more on the advantages of having eyes from the outside. Jan yeah, Aukemann. Yeah. Um, yeah, the advantage is um, uh, well, the fresh eyes 
we were not uh, in the earlier stage of the project uh, uh, connected with it. So um, it's easier to discuss uh, choices made um, and um, yeah, to look um, uh, clean and with a clean sheet on the on the on the design and the the, the choices uh, the project made and to have uh, recommendations um, more out of the box of what uh, what the project team uh, is thinking about. Okay. Thank you very much, Rico and Jan Auke for now. Um, I would like now to see if we can uh, have Wilma on the stage, please. Um, so that we can hear about the Dutch risk assessment approach. Uh, Wilma, there's Wilma. Okay. Yeah. The floor is yours. Just one moment because I'm having technical problems. I don't see my presentation to share. Hey, well, uh, maybe I can share your presentation yeah. then. I have, now I have it. Good. You see my presentation? Yes. Yes, we see it. Okay. Well, Great. thank, yes, thank we you do. for the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, to speak. Um, I'm telling this, uh, and I have a cooperation with Charlotte. Charlotte is uh, uh, monitoring the chat. So uh, she's a colleague in the Knowledge Network SPV, um, and I'll tell you all about it. First, I want to ask you a question. If you have the opportunity to spend 1 billion euros on road safety, what would you prioritize? How do you start? Uh, I want to ask you if, uh, if you can put some words or thoughts of that in the chat, so maybe we can go back there later in the, in the end. Um, I'm going to tell you about the risk assessment approach we use in Holland. Um, it's not new, I think, in a European context, um, but we are very busy with it and uh, having the first uh, experiences and results. And I want to uh, share them with you. And also because it's a session about capacity building, I want to tell you something about the knowledge network who is helping municipalities uh, with the risk analysis. But first, why did we start with uh, the risk assessment approach? Well, a couple of years ago, two years ago, we dropped down from place three till place 11 in the ranking of European countries and road safety. So that was a wake up call. And uh, the central government uh, started to think about a new road safety plan. Uh, it, it's um, published at the end of 2018. Um, and it's also in English available, so uh, Charlotte can put the, the link in uh, the chat if you want to read it. And one of the main issues was that um, the, the, the risk-based policy was uh, implementing uh, in the plan. And governments uh, were well, asked to, to uh, implement that in their own um, yeah, policies. That was a main goal. And the plan uh, also um, uh, describes nine uh, yeah, risk factors, uh, policy themes. Uh, you see them, uh, experiences, road users, safe infrastructure. I mean, they're not new subjects or topics. They, these were the main issues they uh, prioritized. What is the risk assessment approach? Well, an al analysis of road safety situation. Oh, I'm sorry, road safety situation based on safety performance indicators. Um, the safety performance indicators we use are on the right of the slide, uh, safe roads, safe speeds, vehicles, safe participation in traffic and high quality trauma care. Uh, these are also the SPIs used in European context and um, well, we prioritize these also. And the main thing, um, what's new, 
well, more or less new for us, is that it's a proactive uh, way of doing and not a reactive, not waiting till accidents happens, happen, but um, be doing your measures before that happens. And it's assessment, not a set of measures. So you think more on a higher level. And uh, the plan was also uh, said that all regions uh, should have a risk analysis by the end of 2019. And also that the next year, so this year, uh, every municipality has to have an implementation agenda or an imp implementation plan with measures uh, according to the goals they set uh, on the risk factors. Um, at this moment, most regions have a risk analysis um, and a lot of municipalities are busy with their implementation agendas, but I think most of them will finish at 2021. So we're a little behind. They are very busy with it, but how do they get to the knowledge to do so? And ministry has um, implemented a knowledge network um, consisting of two organizations, uh, SWOF and CROW. I'm from CROW and Charlotte is from SWOF. We work together as a team. Uh, you see the pictures uh, of. Uh, the third picture is from Eric. Um, he is in the session also, I believe. And, and we have two other colleagues who are busy with communication and uh, secretary functions and so on. Um, the municipality is asking us, uh, well, how do we start uh, with a risk analysis? What kind of tools can I use? Um, do we have any um, uh, experiences from other uh, regions or municipalities? And all these knowledge we transfer in, uh, in several ways. We have a website, you see it on the right, um, where all information is. So you can look there and also with Google Translate, uh, try to find something for your own use. We have a newsletter and help desk and uh, well, do all kinds of things to help these municipalities and regions to uh, implement this risk analysis and risk approach. Also, we were asked by the central government to help uh, because they, um, uh, the, the, poli the politics, they have decided to, to give 500 million euros per year for the next 10 years for road safety. It's a, a great impulse. Uh, and the, the regions and, and municipalities have to collect the same amount of money themselves. So it will be, uh, I think, uh, have results in road safety in, in, in the coming years. But how do you spend this money? I mean, that should be uh, on, on measures which are effective and efficient. So we thought uh, with the ministry together um, uh, which measures would be uh, appropriate and we made a, a publication about it so that that was used to um, yeah, uh, share and, and give the money. And next year we'll contribute in a, a second chance to think about it again with them. So that's also uh, a role of us. If you and this is another part of the presentation. If you want to uh, start a risk analysis, um, and you think, well, how do I start? Well, we uh, organized a, a sort of training uh, last year. Um, uh, you see here uh, 11 municipalities uh, busy uh, trying to find data for their own region um, because we made a, a kind of roadmap uh, you can use if you don't know where to start. This roadmap consists of uh, six steps uh, and you can look at the basics uh, about uh, uh, figures about your uh, population, how it's been built up, but also very important looking at your infrastructure uh, in Holland cycling is very important, but also road infrastructure. Uh, the speeds, uh, very important issue and a risk indicator and how many drivers drive on the influence of alcohol and medicine. And the crash and accident data still stays important. I mean, uh, it's reactive, but they're still giving much information. And also when you combine these all, how do you prioritize? I mean, every uh, municipality can make their own uh, thoughts, have, having their own thoughts about that. When you see, um, well, an, an example for uh, data about uh, uh, inhabitants, um, you see uh, here a, a couple of municipalities and figures about how many people are 65 to 80 or how many people are young. 
and you see the underlines um, are bigger, higher figures. Uh, so you can make your policy on that if you have a high quality of a high amount of elderly, elderly people in your uh, municipality. Well, then you can see uh, in which neighborhoods they live uh, mostly and, and make adjustments uh, by infrastructure or whatever education for just that that group. So that well, helps you to focus. And for infrastructure design, uh, we have some characteristics uh, to look at your infrastructure and, and score them. And uh, yeah, this, this helps to prioritize uh, which, which roads to tackle first. Um, well, this presentation will be, I think, available for everybody afterwards. So you can look it up, what characteristics are. And if you put these um, uh, characteristics in a, a model or a, an instrument, um, which can uh, give presentation charts uh, where the highest risks on your roads are. Here's an example for cycle cycling infrastructure. You see the red roads are, well, uh, they have the highest risks. Uh, so that's the, these are the roads you, you tackle first when you make up an, an implementation plan, for instance. This is uh, one of the instruments um, which is used to um, to let you see where where is driven most uh, too too fast eh? the the speeding. All these layers of of, of charge uh, you can use uh, as input for your prioritization. At this moment, um, we have um, done a monitor uh, on how the governments are doing, and we made a survey survey uh, to all the municipalities, and there was. One third of the municipalities responded to that. So it's, well, you can say uh, pretty much. Um, and 22% of them had a risk analysis. And we made a, a quick scan uh, of what's in there. And you see the, the chart um, uh, under that. The, the biggest uh, effort is on speeding and, and infrastructure. These are the high, uh, considered the highest risks. And uh, a lot of effort puts into that, but also um, the 30 kilometer zones, uh, cyclists uh, and distraction. These are the main topics in the plans you can uh, see. Um, and the other chart is about, uh, did they do the analysis themselves or did they ask for help? And the light green of the 59% is that they hired somebody to do it for them, um, consultancy agencies and so on. Um, and that's, well, we are in the session of capacity building. Um, that's, well, uh, uh, an issue in Holland that, that there is a lack of um, um, yeah, personnel to do these things and to make these analysis. Uh, people are too busy with daily, daily, daily tasks. And, um, uh, well, that's why there is a knowledge platform and all this help for them to, uh, to do that. Um, the, the main issues in the, in the risk analysis uh, was speeding, infrastructure, and uh, destruction. And, uh, well, we keep on monitoring. Oh, finally, um, how do you spend 1 billion uh, um, euros? Um, my main issue is that you have to uh, take step uh, step uh, aside and think about what are your main risk factors instead of where are my accidents and act upon that. That's the main uh, goal of the risk assessment approach and also our main goal in Holland at this moment. Thank you very much, Wilma. Um, I see one person reacting on your question, how to spend one billion euro. Maybe we give it just a few more minutes and meanwhile I ask another question <laughs> to you, if I may, uh, from the chat actually. Um, so you mentioned that there's a, a co-payment, a co-funding scheme where um, the government funding has to be matched by the city. So the question was if that uh, actually encourages or discourages uh, cities. To, uh, to to use it. Um, and why should it be discouraging? 
Well, because maybe it is, it feels like a big burden no? to, uh, to have to match you, something and have to come up with the same amount uh, that's, that's already. Yeah, well, well, there are, there are municipalities not cooperating with this, um, uh, well, with this opportunity. Uh, you have the choice, you don't have to. And also people are thinking, oh, but I was planning to do this and it's almost finished, but I'm just lacking some amount of money. So I put it in for this. Uh, this purpose. So, different, um, well, different reasons to uh, to react on this call. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's also a very, um, uh, I think it leads to more infrastructure, safe infrastructure, for instance, and that's, well, I think helps a lot in, in uh, uh, promoting the right behavior oh. um, instead of just behavioral messages. Uh, measures. Yes, indeed. Um, I see two people referring to uh, to ISA, so intelligent speed assistance, as one of the key tools and maybe also a good investment opportunity. Um, and uh, one person in the chat is uh, saying, um, if you design to stimulate sustainable, more or more traffic safe modes of transport and safe speed measures, for example, ISA, that's uh, a, a thought to to spend the money and um and and where where to put it what yeah, do you think where to put it where, where to put that discussion uh, because in holland this that's that's the discussion too i mean all these infrastructure adjustments uh, maybe isa is more uh, is better to do um but that's also more on a regional or a european level to uh, to implement and, and stimulate so uh, that's that's right thank you very much um, so I would say, as, uh, so we have uh, some more time at the end to discuss with all. I would leave it here for the moment. Thank you very much. And I'd like to bring in uh, Thiago uh, from Lisbon. And actually, I think it links in very well with what we've just heard about a, a, a data-based approach. I think you've worked a lot with data analysis and, and can, uh, uh, can pursue that further. So uh, Thiago, the floor is yours. Feel free to okay. share your presentation, please. Thank you. So, hi everyone. Uh, just uh, in the first place, I would like to thank to my vision for the opportunity to, to, to share our work uh, in, in Lisbon. So, first of all, in our city was uh, in 2008, we needed to define strategies to help all the pedestrians to walk and live more in our streets. We need to change the scenario and since then, our team work at three principles mission. One, give more accessible streets, give more safety streets, and prevent new barriers in the public spaces. So why we need a pedestrian accessible, accessibility plan? Because uh, our, our, um, our city have uh, uh, our, as, as can you see in the image, uh, you can see our typical streets. Our typical streets uh, with the typical pavement that uh, all the Portuguese and the tourists love. But as you can see, they are not safe for the, the pedestrians because they are very slippery. Also, we have side, um, sidewalks too narrow and in poor condition, as we can see. <coughs> Also, we have another common problem in all the cities that is the illegal and obstructive, obstructive parking in, in our sidewalks, as you can see in the image. So you can see a blind woman uh, struggling with that uh, uh, truck and you see uh, the motors uh, parking in the sidewalk. It's a common problem uh, in our city also. So about the, the, the traditional pavement uh, that we have, uh, the cobblestone, the love cobblestone Portuguese, um, it has three uh, principal problems. One is the slippery, two, uh, irregular joints and uneven surface, for example. As, as you can see, this is not a production image or Photoshop image, but it's a clear image after a raining day 
uh, and this uh, uh, surface of this pavement is very slippery. Uh, even if you use some kind of shoes just to grip it, uh, you all uh, feel that you are not safe to walk in, in our street. And the result is, uh, as you can see in this cerebral image, so as a minimal of type of injuries you can have in our traditional pavement made by the cobblestone. Unfortunately, some pedestrians, they just can't get up because the broken hip, for example, caused by our typical pavement. So, um, we have um, concern about the pedestrian safety in our, in our uh, sidewalk mm -hmm. and uh, we are concerned about um, a, a specific moment that pedestrians uh, have, uh, are more vulnerable. It's the, 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 the crosswalks. So, we study a crosswalk, uh, a very well-known crosswalk near to the East Station and in the East Station uh, it's very important the place in our city because you uh, have a train station there that go to everywhere in Portugal. Let's go to the, the north, to Porto, or go to Algarve if you want it, or simply go to the strictly direct to the center in the, uh, our street, our, our, our city. Also, we have there uh, a parking taxis. It's all about 18 park uh, taxis. Uh, parking spaces and also we can we, we will not study the, the other part of the east station uh, but also we have uh, another kind, kind of buses around there that go also to another place in other regions of Portugal so it's a very busy uh, busy local so as you can see in this image um, this is the the station from Calatrava uh, this is uh, the, um, the, the main cross, crosswalk that we study there uh, and as you can see uh, it, have, it has a 6 meter wide uh, in extension and 32 meters long to, to, to run, literally run. Why we say to run? Uh, because uh, the law says that um, you have almost uh, 40, uh, let me guess my notes, the, the law says that you, uh, the signal uh, here, the light pedestrians says you can have a green light to walk this about 30 seconds, so it gives you one meter per second but the law shows shows that uh, you need a half a time to to walk one meter. So this is a far way along to to go. Here in this data analysis that we had, this data source from the crash pedestrian, uh, we we had a record that uh, almost in eight years we had two serious injuries on this uh, treadmill, as you can see on this square, red square. So we, we used uh, this MyoVision Scout uh, with, uh, during one hour uh, on a Friday to count the cars and the pedestrians that pass through that crosswalk. So the result it was the pedestrian count on the East Station, uh, we counted, um, oh, where is my, I just lost my notes here, <laughs> okay, there it is. Uh, we verified that during the, this period we counted 1,657 people crossing the crosswalk, more than 60% came from the East Station side to the shopping center, that is 1,015 people. We also count the car and we, we registered about uh, 326 cars. This means that it's about 50% on each side. One inter interesting thing is that we counted more people, more pedestrian crossing that zebra than the cars. 
So the proposal that we came out uh, with the little change uh, to walk that uh, uh, that treadmill is divide by sections and reducing the crossing distance from the 32 meters to maximum that is come on, on, on your left side to your right side and in divided by three and we suppress one lane here and another lane here we can give more spaces to the pedestrians just stop here and introduce more um, more more lighting, uh, and then you can cross with a, a little distance and make it more safety for the pedestrian. Thank you. Thank you. Here I am again. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little, a few uh, instants to come, come back on. Uh, thank you very much, Tiago. Uh, it's really, really very interesting, and uh, also this uh, this approach on on using data and using technology to uh, to measure what's actually going on, and then to uh, to have a good basis for for, for the measures. Um, I was wondering um, maybe two things. Um, one is when you uh, when you then uh, presented the design how how was the reaction was uh, was it difficult to convince people based on what you had done before was it difficult also for example for car drivers to to accept or or was it uh, then an easy ride once you you had it all clear in your mind well uh, at the first glance uh, when they came up when, when we came up with this project uh, the first idea was, oh no, we don't need to, to, to suppress the lines. We have a, a bridge that actually exists, a bridge uh, that you can go from the shopping hall to the, to the east station. Uh, and uh, we want to open that to, to the people. But in, in fact, um, as you can see in the, in the project, we, saw, we, we said to them that if we only divide the all that the, that crossing uh the people uh can really go to a to point a to to go to a to b uh with the less uh, with the same time with with more safety and then they they are uh, studying our proposals uh, our project and the project will be uh, starting doing probably in the next year okay Great. Um, now let's maybe um, take advantage of the fact that Roman of Mio Vision is here as well. Um, maybe he could say just a little bit about the equipment that, that you used. And uh, I see in the chat, Pedro is asking, why is this particular equipment useful? Why is it your method better than old fashioned head counting? Um, we can't hear you for now. I'm, it looks like- There you go, oh, yeah, unmuted. No, Yes, um, thank you very much for participating or that I was able to participate in this session. And um, why is our or solution or the product we, we a little bit better than the old fashioned head count? That is, um, I can give you um, a picture of myself right now. So it is getting the proper data versus somebody sleeping on the side of the road. So because we had from from lots of people, we've heard that um, when you do the old traditional methods, particular placing people at the intersection or at the corridor, um, the hours are way too long. You only get a very short snapshot, people not paying the proper attention. And with a video based count, you have the opportunity to go back and forth and not only um, looking at the volumes itself and the turning movements, but you also can use the video um, to do um, quantitative analysis. So how are pedestrians are actually moving? Can you find first um, indicators of near hit misses, for example, a very important indicator now in safety analytics, we think is because a lot of cities around the world are declaring intersections dangerous based up on the fatalities. 
but if you look a little bit closer and check on near hit misses for example or ways how um, particular people or road users use the intersection you could actually um, prevent these fatalities much much earlier and can basically declare particular um, infrastructures within the city or urban setting um, dangerous without having um, these fatalities in the aftermath so you know, you don't need to have a loss of human life to understand that something is dangerous. Indeed, yes. Um, and I think that's very much also the approach of the, the risk-based analysis that uh, Wilma was talking about before. And it's also an approach that we've been, yep. um, we've been taking also uh, with our European legislation on infrastructure, for example, that you can't uh, wait for, uh, for crashes to happen, but you, you identify risky areas before by um, by certain factors that you that you actually know. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Now I would like every panelist, so all the panelists, to join me, join us again on on the on the virtual stage. So let's see if we can have everyone. Um, Suzanne and Wilma as well. There you all are, fantastic. Great. So we have a bit more time to um, to discuss some questions, maybe with all of you and. Uh, uh, and to have some some exchange, I'd like to kick off with a question to um, to all of you. Actually, I think one thing that has come back a few times is uh, acceptance and um, and and the fact that you have to do a lot of convincing to um, to, uh, to to get uh, measures done and and to. Uh, um, to make sure that they're done in a, in a proper way. So one issue of that is, for example, citizen participation, uh, reaching out to stakeholders, cooperation with other departments. Um, is there, are there tips and tricks you can share? Is there some, some approach that you found particularly useful? And, and how, in your specific cases, how do you go about involving others in, in the, your thinking process and in the development? Uh, now let's see, maybe Suzanne, would you like to go first? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Well, I would uh, say that. Uh, yeah. When we one of our success factors has been that we meet the rescue services, the public transport providers, the police, uh, once in a month to uh, talk to them about the suggestions that we have for speed management management measures because if we don't have them with us we can't do the measures so um, i think we have had that um, cooperation for about 20 years and um, uh, we also when we put all the uh, speed measurements in uh, the residential areas it's almost always by request from the uh, from the inhabitants in that area they are so active mm. in asking for this kind of measures. Uh, but I wouldn't say that we have a dialogue or co-designing with the citizens when it comes to speed management uh, uh, mm. measures, no. Yeah. Uh, Wilma, um, would you like to add something to that? Yeah, no, in Holland we have uh, an organization um, which has a digital uh, a website to uh, pinpoints the the not safe places uh, in your area and and on uh, actions after that are um, yeah going to talk to these people and and made an arrangement with the neighborhood and police and 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 government to look if they are really unsafe places and um, well are there measures needed um, so it's it's, also, it's always going into direct contact if there is a problem which um, yeah, which is most helpful, I think, for, for people to give them the right feeling that they're heard. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Tiago, how do you do it in Lisbon? Uh, in Lisbon, uh, so uh, not uh, not all the time. It's it's easy to convince the the, the others uh, to to adjust the, the the road dimensions, to adjust the the, the flow, the traffic flow. Uh, because it's uh, it's another way to think, to think from the pedestrian side, not the vehicle side. Uh, so it's uh, having uh, we had uh, some trouble to rethink, to reformulate the, the think, 
but now um, I, I get some SMS, some uh, someone called just to to ask from the department tra traffic to uh, to ask me, oh, what can I do uh, to change a little bit here because we have a, a zebra too long or we need to adapt for the, the for the old the elder people. Uh, so uh, I I think that. Uh, the the scenario is changing for a while. is a it's step by step. Uh, we need to uh, add convincing to to them, and and of course we have the the bike lens. Uh, uh, we have the the our teamwork that works and projects the the, the bike lens in our streets also, and uh, we need also to talk with them to convince uh, some. Uh, some designs are not very safety for the pedestrians. We need to put the pedestrians first and then the, the other mobilities uh, ways uh, in the second and third and so on. So it's, it's, we haven't been so, uh, if we have the time, we need time to convince them that we really need to, to change and convince the, the, the parking and, and the, the, the directors to to change the, the idea from the public space and the design street. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and Rico, maybe I mean you were brought in as a as a, an outside pair of eyes. Um, but uh, did you uh, have did, did your work have a component on um, citizens' involvement? Actually, the, the whole project as it is now is out of of. Uh, Movement because uh, the original plan was was destroyed, so to say, by by the by the Antwerp uh, citizens. Uh, so actually, the, the the situation was the whole way around, the, all, all the other way around. Uh, the citizens wanted another approach with a lower speed, with less cars, uh, with another model split, um, and it took very long to convince uh, the governments. Um, but now everybody has adopted to this idea, but you can see, especially on a national level, that some people um, from their experience with other projects have to, well, to, to get used to this idea that this project is not a, a, a normal highway, so to say. Um, but I think this, this Antwerp project is very inspiring. Also, for example, for highway projects in the Netherlands within build-up areas to and say, hey, you can do it also another way. There's no need to drive 130 kilometers per hour through your city. It can be done mm. different. And it was very inspiring, inspiringly done uh, in Antwerp. OK. Um, and then as we're talking about um, capacity building here, so I would like to hear maybe also from whoever in, in the panel would like to take the question. Um, why um, are there important things that uh, that need to be right from the beginning when someone approaches you for for your advice on on how to uh, to move on with a road safety project or with a whole road safety assessment or an audit? Um, if other cities wanted to learn from from you, where is the the best place to start? Um, and and what is is there maybe one thing or several things that you find yourself explaining over and over again um, that are important to to really get right? Maybe if I um, think yes. a little bit, um, what we've seen quite often now around Europe itself is um, is data accuracy. So how how accurate is the data you are actually looking at, and where does it come from? So a lot of people have you know they speculate um, they they take statistically insignificant data sets, um, things like this. And that what we've seen um, quite often within our customer base, it's a kind of re-explaining on, on the importance of the actual data you are using, and not only from road volumes, but also in terms of crashes, other data sets besides this. So taking more information into your decision-making process. I think that's a it's a very important aspect and from some of the talks of I've, I've seen that you know measurements are taken or are put in place but there's never a real um, post analysis you know is this really effective did it change anything so it's um 
again, the, the actual data is missing in order to make those decisions. And in an age where we have all these opportunities and possibilities, we should take advantage of those. Thank you. I see uh, nods around Wilma, for example, um, you, you and, and Suzanne as well, but maybe first to Wilma. Um, so does that ring true with all your work for uh, with, with cities and uh, what are the things that you are uh, often confronted well, with? Well, I was nodding because um, um, mostly our governments are used to uh, collect or, or implement measures and not thinking about the goals just above that what I want to achieve and which measures do belong to that goal. And, and that's what we try to well, put between the ears I think, <laughs> in a certain way, that they think about what, what kind of goal do I want to achieve? And from that point, uh, collecting the measures, uh, yeah, ad adopting to that. Mm -hmm. Not answering your question. Uh, Suzanne is not, yes, no, absolutely. Um, Suzanne was nodding as well. Um, you, you said you can't be complacent, no? that there was uh, some uh, maybe some new uh, motivation needed as well. Um, how, how do you spread that spirit? Um, yeah, I think we uh, <laughs> spread that spirit. That's a very good one. <laughs> well, uh, always go back to the vision zero and what's the basis for the vision zero? Uh, it's all about the uh, uh, human tolerance against crash violence and what mental abilities we have as humans to manage the traffic situations. That is always the basis. And to work with safe streets, safe vehicles and safe users. So you can sort of find your different boxes and really look at speed as the regula regulator in the system. If we can fulfill the other boxes, speed is the regulator. Um, and of course, you need a lot of things. You, re you need data that is accurate. Uh, and we have had very good experience from the hospital data, even though they can point out the ex exact place where it is. It's, it's good enough to understand what happens. And for cities that are starting their work now, now, I think there are a lot of cities that have been working for quite some time. And we know some, uh, some things that are generic wherever you are. And there are a lot of studies that we can share, for example, with the cities. I've been working uh, uh, with a couple of cities in South America uh, to share our uh, experience uh, when they are starting their work. And that's so amazing to see when it sort of, ah, this is what it's all about. And that's a very, uh, yeah, warm in my heart. Very good feeling. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that sounds, uh, uh, that sounds very good indeed. <clears throat> um, just staying on, on capacity building, maybe uh, we could have another round of uh, seeing where you think um, th the best ways of building and then maintaining, stabilizing capacity uh, would be. So uh, maybe in, inside your own organization, how do you do that? Then uh, building alliances with others. You now we've heard as well that it's never just an approach of just one uh, transport authority, but uh, you really need uh, you need all other others on board as well. So on within your own organization, within your own uh, surroundings, and then maybe let's see as it's a European event, is there a European dimension to that? And uh, how, where do you see that? What's already working well? I know, uh, of course, Polis uh, and, uh, is doing a great work uh, in in spreading knowledge uh, around Europe. We are trying to help as well. Uh, where do you see, is there more potential to maybe help others for you as well to benefit from all these uh, these areas? Should we start? Uh, yes, yeah, Nico? Um, what I found interesting in this Antwerp project is what that that they really decided themselves that they wanted the road safety audit and and the um, human factors analysis um, because they needed a um, let's say a clarification that everything was was safe enough um, and what we see in other projects in uh, in Europe and especially in the Netherlands that well road safety audits for highways are are obliged you have to do them. Um, but a lot of projects uh, are just wanting to get this check. The road safety audit was done, but uh, are not really interested in 
getting things better uh, in that project. So um, if it's out of outside of the scope of the of the small project, um, well, all also road safety measures that were were asked for are just being put aside. So um, I think on a European level um, and on a national level, it would be good um, to to find a way to to make not only the road safety audit system system um, to be to be to have to be done, but also um, to do something with the outcomes of it, because otherwise it's just getting this check and then nothing, not too much is done with it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Who would like to go next? Um, Tiago, maybe? So um, it, it's, I think that's the, the road safety, it's now on, on the head of everyone that the, uh, had the potential to, to do something. Uh, our colleagues on traffic department also have the same uh, ideas. The, the, they are working with us and the other partners uh, around the, uh, Europe. I know the, 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 the concern that they have about the safety roads. Um, so uh, this this is a work, uh, a teamwork that we need to to reinforce and to bring more ideas. I think it's it's very important that we need, uh, study and uh, research the, 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 the new instruments, new high tech instruments like uh, the, the, the scout from Iovision to to show not just for the decision of the, of the public, uh, the, the needs that uh, uh, a street or uh, uh, something must be done, but also show to the others, to the, 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 the users of the street, to the pedestrians, to the, to the, uh, to the drivers, why, uh, uh, why do we are changing the, 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 the streets, the design streets? So uh, I think the, 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 the other phase, that, uh, the changing the street is to show the others why we are doing this. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe for Wilma as well, um, what's the um, a wider dimension of capacity building within the Netherlands and then also do you see a, a European dimension to it? Um, well, I'm, I think about the, the, having the right knowledge to, to, uh, to take the right measures and everything and we see that um, um, we have our main um, target group are the municipalities and the regions. Uh, but we also see that the consultancy firms are a target group for us too. So Rico, you're a target group uh, for us uh, and uh, Jan Auke. Um, because they are doing a lot of work for these uh, regions and municipalities and um, they have to have the right knowledge too. So we see them also as, as our new target group and incorporating them also in our activities. Um, and the regions are also, uh, well, uh, taking their role uh, very good because they uh, collect these municipalities in, in specific uh, meetings and tell them all about the risk approach and, and road safety issues. Um, and by doing that, the municipalities can collect the right information which they are not be able to do themselves because they have too lack, lack, lacking time to, to uh, collecting all the, the information they need. And that's if in small municipalities is that uh, is that the case uh, at this moment uh, thank you and lastly maybe not once back to uh, Suzanne um, so you mentioned already that you're working with South America so um, this uh, sort of capacity is that a network how did you make contact but were they contacting you or uh, how how do others find you well <laughs> um, I, I well I have been doing some work in uh, international and uh, I've had some presentations and it was the Bloomberg philanthropies uh, and um, that found me and had engaged me because they are doing a lot of work in uh, uh, South America in Asia and in Africa so they engaged me to uh, to okay. uh, sort of That's great. 
<laughs> had them in there. Well, then it, occasions like this, of course, that uh, now we had a, a, a very nice big audience. So uh, yeah. then hopefully, maybe you'll be contacted again by, by some others. Let's hope that uh, yeah. uh, this is also a launch uh, of some exchanges and maybe uh, of seeding some ideas in, in other people's minds. So I see we have uh, reached the end of our session. Thank you very much to all panelists for this, uh, for the really inspiring presentations, for the great exchanges and the discussion. Um, so um, I think we've learned a lot of things, I have at least. So um, maybe what, what I would take away is, uh, we can't afford to be complacent. Of course, we all know there's lots of work to do still on road safety, wherever we are. Um, sometimes it helps to get